Tim Gordon studied at the Otis Arts Institute in Los Angeles in the late 1970s and has continued to work as an artist ever since. Her first solo exhibition design office took place at New York's White Columns in 1981. And for the past 30 plus years, she's worked across multiple disciplines and varied fields, art, design, film and video, writing, fashion, music with Free Kitten, Body Head, Glitter Bust, and a little band you might have heard of called Sonic Youth. In that time, she's also married, birthed a baby and divorced. She's been described as fearless, shy, iconic, uncompromising, authentic, and fuck off cool. <laughs> Everyone, please uh, welcome Kim Gordon. You know, you're, I was going to say, you're a bit of an overachiever, let's, <laughs> let's face it. I'm, I'm struggling to keep a job in sales during the day. <laughs> and uh, I'm not kidding. I've, <laughs> I've got a resume for anyone who's kidding. Um, and uh, you, you've just been generally slaying it since you were pretty much born. I wanted to just... <laughs> get through this because I'm just going to keep laughing. <laughs> um, after, this is good. I, I said <laughs> my main thing tonight was I want you to have a good time. I want, you to have a, I want you to have a laugh and a good time. But I want to go back. I want to talk about Little Kim, not Lil Kim, Little Kim. <laughs> um, you grew up <laughs> with, uh, would you say, fairly bohemian parents? Um, no, they weren't bohemian. They were just um, unconventional and, um, you know, kind of uh, grew up poor in the Depression era. And both of them were the only ones in their, from their families that I think went to college. Yep. Um, and I don't know, for whatever reason, they just had a really unique perspective on... Um, you know, on conventions and suburbia and California life. And they had some friends who were more, more bohemian than they were. They weren't bohemian, but they had some friends who, that were. That were? Yeah. So you went on, like, you know, like maybe camping trips, that sort of thing, and... Um, it was kind of... Um, well, they had this... Uh, these friends who... Well, one of them actually was... Um, one of my dad's graduate students. He was a professor and a, later a dean at UCLA in the education and sociology department. And he actually was brought in to create that curriculum. Right. Sociology and education at that point weren't actually put together. But he, for his uh, PhD, he did a social system of a high school and kind of recognized different groups like the the cool, you know, the uh, nerds and then the popular kids and the jocks and the... Which remind, like, so you've seen Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Yes. <laughs> so pretty much that bit where Grace, the principal's um, secretary, says about Ferris Bueller, the sportos, the motorheads, geeks, sluts, bloods, waste oys, dweebies, dickheads, they all adore him, they think he's a righteous dude. Maybe if it wasn't for your dad... That line would not have even appeared in Ferris Bueller. That's quite possible. <laughs> <laughs> so it was your dad that was the sociologist. Yes. And um, anyway, so Maxie, the, the woman, yeah, she was a, sort of my dad's and her husband Connie, or Conrad, they had like, yeah, a little. you know, different gender names. And um, they lived out in Malibu and they had this great beach house and they would have incredible... They were really great gourmets, which was like before, you know, Nouveau California cuisine. People referred to like gourmet cooking or something like that. And they they were hunters and they'd go salmon fishing and but they were also, you know, intellectuals and they were documentary filmmakers and so I, we would go out there a lot and kind of. Um, in that kind of community. Like, I remember being there the night that um, Kennedy was 
elected and you know, I was pretty young and it was so late at night, but I could just feel the energy of around and how excited and how important it was and um, please pass the delicious smoked salmon. Yeah. <laughs> Yay JFK. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, your mum, you, you've referred to as having creative tendencies. Oh yeah, she, um, yeah, one of her greatest works. <laughs> no, she... Was uh, you. Uh, Boom! <laughs> She, um, now I remember she made this collage of New Yorker magazine covers. Yep. Like a big kind of, you know, eight by 10 thing. And she put it above the stove and she referred to it as a grease catcher. But I thought this is like kind of amazing. I don't yeah. know, like, um. At the time, did you think it was amazing or? I kind of did, actually. I kind of thought, well, this is, I liked, it felt good to see her making things. And then she also did other kind of weird, um, I don't know how she figured out how to do it because I was trying to replicate it, but I couldn't figure it out. But it's like a crafty thing of sticking shells in some kind of like, you know, cement on yep. a piece of wood and hanging it up. And I thought, I'm kind of interested in that sort of um, do-it-yourself art that's like somewhere between um, design and what is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that pretty much art you've just explained? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm that's, not going to remember I, that's that. That's what I strive for. What is it? You know, like, <laughs> it, it looks a little like art or design or some weird object, but I'm not sure what it is. As long as it makes you feel something. Well, it doesn't have to make you feel anything. That's left up to the individual. Yeah. You're, um, you have a brother as well, Keller. And uh, so the two of you growing up, you know, from, from reading your book especially, had a, a pretty kind of, it seems like a fairly run-of-the-mill brother-sister type of relationship. Um, but it further developed into, he was kind of, he wasn't that great. He wasn't that nice to you. Yeah, he was, he was <clears throat> kind of mean. I mean, he was super, very verbal, different than me, and um, highly critical, and I guess I was overly sensitive, but he was, it, I felt like it went beyond, um, you know, the usual sibling kind of right, pounding each other. Stuff. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, but he was a really big personality. He was charismatic, he was eccentric. Uh, people, he had a following of nerds around him. <laughs> uh, you know, he kind of mined that and he, um, so you know, he was a big personality. So I always, you know, at some point he became uh, schizophrenic and it was, you know, it's like a weird disease. It's hard to separate the personality from the, the disease. And, um, but he basically became unsocialized and he was living in Malibu in a trailer and he took a lot of acid and I think it, maybe it ticked off something that was there, but right. I'm, not, I'm not really sure. But, um, but it, it definitely was very, our relationship and those dynamics were really formative for me, for better or worse. It made me into who I am. And at a certain point, I realized that I was... It's weird when your dynamics change. You're used to being the younger one, looking up to an older brother. Yep. Out of fear and vibration. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then they, they kind of come to you and go, oh, I'm so unhappy. And it, it was very strange. And... Um, do you think that that's, um, you know, when, when people uh, talk about you, I guess they do say things like, you know, that you're quite shy or is it that you're guarded? Mm -hmm. And yeah, when you yeah, say yeah. formative, you know, your, your, brother, your, your relationship with your brother probably kind of contributed to, to you hanging on to stuff? Yeah, I mean, I think it was a combination of... Um, I don't know, just not being that verbal and, but 
becoming really vigilant about my feelings and kind of hiding my feelings because he teased me so, you know, mercilessly about everything. Because he kind of give you shit if he saw you cry or, you know, watching a movie or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, maybe into kind of a vigilant person as far as, in guarded in a way, I guess. Yep. And I, and I think that, um, you know, making art and even performing is a way of having a certain freedom where I can now express all these other feelings that... He was also like somebody who was always getting in trouble. So I always was the good one. And um, we, you kind of um, feel like you have to be make everything all right for okay, everybody yeah. as a younger sibling, seeing like all this stuff happening and the conflict in the family. And... Yeah. But I, so I felt like on stage it was a way to um, express other feelings or emotions that I wouldn't necessarily feel like I could. Yeah. Apparently um, you wanted to be a dancer. I did, yeah. I, yeah, I, um, yeah I, I mean, when I was 13, 14, I took um, art classes outside of school and also um, Martha Graham classes. And, but my mother was very uh, specific about, you know, that this is, I don't know, she's the one who thought it would be good, but then she was like, oh, you don't want to be a dancer. That's too hard. Right. And it's also kind of like show business. Like the idea of being a performer was... Yeah. Even though modern dance is uh, not exactly um, the Rockettes or anything. <laughs> no. Woo! Although I'd like to see that. Um, what, I mean, what did you... Did you used to dance a lot at home? I did, yeah. We put records on. My dad had like a a lot of jazz records and blues and classical music. And I would, um, actually, I, I, had, I would look at his record collection and um, make a story. I would make a narrative, taking the images and putting them in, in an order. And then I would put on each record and sort of dance around listening to it. And then, then I would switch out around the order. Yeah, right. I don't know. Maybe it was like an early... Obsessive compulsive thing. I don't know, <laughs> but uh, I really milked those record covers. Yeah, right. <laughs> like uh, it was, um, um, yeah. Like there was one, this Chet Baker record, with this woman who, um, she's she, topless. What? Yet, Hang on a minute. <laughs> a record cover from back then, and there was. Yeah. Well, she had all these like um, you know bubbles in front of her, and then she had like these two puppets. Like, um, <laughs> and it was like, you know, like, I don't know, forget the performer, like this, when I see this TV show with these two puppets, like Lamb Chop and something else. I remember Lamb Chop. And they were kind of in front of her breasts. And I was like, I was like, what is the deal with this cover? Like, it was just like, I couldn't figure it out. And I was like, is that the same Lamb Chop that I've seen on TV? It's like, oh, it was very mysterious. <laughs> Well, Sonic Youth ended up having a, a toy on the front of one of their covers, at least. Maybe that was harking back to yeah, I don't, a need for lamb chop. Yeah, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, but um, uh, I, it wasn't till later that I really appreciate Chet Baker records. Yeah, because you were listening to some, like, pretty classic jazz albums growing up, weren't you? Like Bessie Smith and... Yeah, a lot of Billie Holiday, Bessie Smith, um, Charlie Parker and John Coltrane, things like that. Yeah. And later on, I know that you were listening to Joni Mitchell, but a a sort of in a different way, maybe? Um, Well, when I was a teenager, it was more, um, yeah, in my room listening to, like, Joni Mitchell and um, Pining for a Life in Laurel Canyon. (laughs) Of course. <laughs> As opposed to the really boring, kind of existentially banal <laughs> suburban West L.A., which even today has no identity. Right. Part of L.A. 
But you love it though, right? What's that? LA. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I do. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I moved back there a year ago. And... Yeah. Yeah. Back to your roots. Yeah. You said you were too young to be a hippie. Yeah, I was kind of more of a weekend hippie. Um, and, um, you know, yeah, my brother was a hippie. I mean, I, you know, I wasn't, I was old enough to smoke pot and things like that. But, you know, as far as going to, like, being politically involved and going to demonstrations, I would. But, um, and I supported the teacher strike at school. Which right, lasted for stuff. pretty much a whole semester. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it was kind of, uh, you know, I just felt like I didn't have uh, the legitimacy of, like, somebody who was older, you know, like an, a college student or something. Right. From L.A., you, uh, you moved to New York. Pretty pivotal. Yeah, I just felt like if I really wanted to be an artist, I should move to New York. Um, people like... How did I that just, pan out for you? <laughs> uh, no, I, I'm glad that I did. I mean, people like Mike Kelly and Jim Shaw and Marty Weber were some of the first people coming out of CalArts. I mean, aside from the um, some older artists, but who stayed in L.A., you know, who didn't move to New York. Right. And, um, but I don't know, I just felt like I needed, you know, New York was so exciting, all the history of, like, Penny Warhol and the factory and, um, you know, all the, all the galleries that I'd heard about and, um, you know, it's just, like, such a rich history. I just felt like I had to, to go there. So you definitely went there, like, at that point in time. You weren't thinking about being in a band at all. No, I, before I moved, I had met this artist, Dan Graham, and so when I moved there, I looked him up, and he took me to a lot of, um, actually, see a lot of music, like, in the downtown scene, um, people like Glenn Branca and Reese Chatham and different No Way bands, and... Um, but it was sort of like... The, like coming towards the end of the no wave scene at yeah, that point. Yeah, it was point. kind of towards. Yeah, DNA was still around. Um, Mars was still around. Um, Glenn Braga had a band called The Static with Barbara S, who's a visual artist, and you know there were there there's still like kind of a scene around that, and um, you know I just thought that it was. It really exciting. It was different than punk rock. It was actually so much more free than punk rock I'd seen in L.A. And Dan had this, um, he had, he has this famous performance piece called Audience uh, Performer Mirror or something like that, where he would have a huge mirror behind him and he would stand and look at the audience and describe them. And then he would turn around and describe himself and his self-consciousness and shifts of weight and things like that, with the audience looking in the mirror. And he wanted to do the piece with an all-girl band, and he asked me if I would do it, and he introduced me to this girl, Stanton Miranda. So we, born, we formed a trio with this other girl, Christine Hahn, who was a drummer for the Static and went on to play with Malaria. And I played guitar, Miranda played bass, and... Um, I made up lyrics from ad copy from women's magazines like Cosmopolitan Girl and Genius. Um, like soft polish, like about separates. <laughs> I like what you said. <laughs> and lipstick colors and stuff. Right. And um, anyway, so we did this one show and we were, our, the idea was that we were supposed to play and then each one of us at different times was supposed to do something with the audience, like some disruption or something. And we are so nervous. Um, I think Christine just got up and went to the bathroom. And came back. <laughs> he, he considered it a kind of a failure, but we, we didn't. Yeah. You know, it was just kind of, well, what was it really supposed to do? You know, it was, 
and what did they think and what did it sound like? And um, I think you've mentioned, like, even though he wanted you to do something, because yeah. he was also, um, Dan was really kind of into a lot of girl bands. Yes, he was, um, he wrote articles about femi called Feminism and Rock and stuff like that. Um, so he had, that's how he got the idea to do it with a right. girl band. And, you know, it was, there is a certain amount of um, hands-off manipulation in that setup. So the fact that it, I didn't see it as a failure. I just thought, well, that's kind of, to me, it was, like, exciting. Like, I think it was a win for you because it's, like, the guy is telling right, the girl band what and to do. Like, and well, you can't, you know, that's just, like, you can't do that. Yeah. Otherwise, you're Kim Fowley and... Yeah. It's like 1970. So that's why, like, I think of Dan as, as, as quite the pivotal figure yeah. in, in your career as well. Yeah, but he also... Um, so then after that, it was like, well... And then Christine left to go play with Malaria, so we didn't really have a band anymore, and we would endlessly rehearse and try out other people, but it never really worked. The band was called Interjection? Yeah. Um... And she introduced me to Thurston. That's how I met Thurston. And, um, you know, we started playing music together. Him and this girl, Anne DeMarinus, who was Vito Conchi's girlfriend at the time. So you went, like... And just before we let Dan Graham leave the room, he... You also did an, in, an art installation in his house that I find... Mildly hilarious. Yeah, I had this thing called Design Office um, because I didn't have a peer group when I moved to New York. A lot of people like who went to Cal Arts, which was the number one art school where you actually they turned out artists, successful artists. Um, I couldn't afford to go there because I wasn't poor or rich enough. So. <laughs> I, you know, I kind of fumbled my way through my education and, you know, ended up with a zero balance. <laughs> I'm really proud of that. <laughs> but, um... You took his oven out of his house. Oh, yeah. You removed so, his oven. Um, yeah, we lived in these... I, he lived upstairs with me and there were these railroad apartments where it's basically one long... You know, there's the kitchen and... In this case, the bathtub was also in the kitchen. Naturally. There's like a long part and then a more square room at the end. It's kind of all open. And Dan never cooked. He ate out like every single night. So I took this... Yeah, so this idea of design office was somewhat practical and somewhat like a psychological kind of reflecting something about the person. Right. I was saying something about them. It, it meant to be some kind of intervention. And so I took out his stove and I put in this Pirelli tile because he was obsessed with this tile. He talked right. about it all the time as something at, that was... Um, you, you saw it in, like, bank foyer. Things. I don't, he kept talking... You know, he was obsessed with Elder Rossi, this uh, <laughs> Italian architect, and the idea... <laughs> the um, postmodernist idea of um, the city is your home sort of thing. Yep. And that was kind of an influence too. And So anyway, I put the Pirelli tile in his um, kitchen and then I did a watercolor color of um, Debbie Harry. Beautiful. On typewriter paper and gave it to him. So that was like up next to his Joe Bear minimalist paintings. <laughs> And his Robert Mangold. So it's because he, he was obsessed with... Right. Or he, I think he just liked women. But, he, you know, he was like, you know... Uh, you might be on Women something. in rock. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and then and he really encouraged me to write. And, um, but I, in a... I decided to write about male <laughs> masculine sexuality or and men in rock. Basically, and I, I wrote this essay called Trash, Drugs, and Male Bonding, which 
was about, um, it was basically a description of Reese Chatham's guitar trio, who was a downtown composer. Okay. And he, you basically, he had studied um, overtones with Lamont Young, and he and Glenn Branca sort of transferred that to the electric guitar. So he was playing with two other people, and everything was tuned the same, so you'd have those like overtones. Right. Uh, and there was a drug, a very popular drug at the time, called um, Locker Room. It was the anal nitrate. It was like we've all been there. <laughs> so what they would do is like you know they would take like a big you know hit, yeah. sniff that, and then they would start like downstroking. Um, <laughs> it was funny because it was so formal. Yeah, know, right. Very, it's very formal. It is, think, uh, you know, we are at the, um, that end of Paran. I'm sure there's some, <laughs> some poppers in the house. Yeah. <laughs> we could all have a really big Friday night. You also, um, Dan Graham as well, I know I keep going back to him, but I really did find that um, he was quite orchestral with a few things, but he, you know, that, that piece that you performed that he didn't think went so well, was also um, what got you interested in the relationship between the artist and the, um, uh, the audience and the performer. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that, that definitely, his work, um, yeah, it very much uh, made me think about that, which is, I still like write about that and think about that a lot. I think it's really interesting. Does it shift and change the way you feel about the relationship you have as, let's say, as a performer, uh -huh. musically, with your audience? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I haven't really come to any um, big conclusions about it, but it's just kind of, um, no, you know, I'm kind of um, still fascinated by um, what that is, you know, you see it in different parts of the media all the time, and um, like the way people, you know, why people like Donald Trump, you know, he's so confident, and you know, people want to believe performers, like they believe in themselves, they want to see somebody have that confidence and make those gestures and, and um, that they can project on, and um, that's what's happening in American politics. Celebrity branding, kind of. Yeah, and it's, it's um, interesting if you can make people feel uncomfortable in a performance situation because so much in the culture is not spontaneous. Even if you go you know, see a band, um, you know, everything is pretty choreographed, like it's kind of the same set every night, or the lights are all programmed, or it's kind of the seamless um, situation. And it's just my personal taste that I like to see things fall apart a little bit. <laughs> you know, yeah, a bit of chaos and bringing it back. Yeah, because sometimes it makes it into something else, or it's an experience that you're never going to have. Um, um, that, was, that was one of the kind of amazing things about Nirvana, as self-destructive as Kurt was. Um, it was, um, you know, some amazing shows that I got to witness when he would, um, you know, just like hurl himself on the drum set or like, you know, jump into the audience or at like um, some like... Reading Festival, like when they were on at two in the afternoon and nobody knew who they were, who they were and, um, you know, things like that. Or, you know, what Iggy did in early on, you know, when he first started going out to the audience and breaking glass and smearing his body with peanut butter, whatever. It's like, what, what was that? Oh, was James. that like, was, did he think that was entertaining? Yeah, <laughs> he was, you know, but nobody had ever seen anyone act like that before, and um, and that was, you know, in like the '60s, where everything is supposed to be about like peace and love and 
you know, the Beatles. Music and, yeah, or, I mean, it was starting to, like, edge, you know, there was that, and then there was, like, more of the dark underside of, like, you know, the, even the doors or... Yeah. That pretentious arty band. Yeah. <laughs> that guy with the leather pants. Great, but, yeah. Um, yeah. 1981 was when Sonic Youth formed. You and Thurston had met around that, that time. Uh, and Lee Ronaldo as well? Uh, yeah, Lee was around. We saw him playing with different people, and we had this... Uh, the first group we had was with Anne, and we had different names all the time. We kept trying to find the right name, and <laughs> she played keyboards, and uh, eventually we realized it just, like, wasn't working, and we asked Lee to play with us. So just going back a little bit when you said that you, you got up and you performed in this band for Dan Graham, and you just played the guitar, you didn't really talk about learning to play the guitar? Uh, okay, well, I had this guitar that um, I was subletting a, a place in Jenny Hol Holzer's loft, and this girl, Mary Lemley, lived there. And she gave me this guitar. She, her boyfriend had given it to her, and they broke up. She's like, take this, I don't want it. So. And then this guy, Jeffrey Lone, who was a composer, who was in this band, Theoretical Girls, at one point with Glenn Branca, showed me how to play kind of half chords. They're kind of like jazz chords, yep. basically. Um, so that's kind of all I knew how to play. And I could play rhythm. That's all I, you know, just like rhythm, rhythms. <laughs> so, when you, so when you started Sonic Youth, were there, you, you were specifically there to play guitar, bass? Well, yeah, at first I was playing guitar. Um, but I have to say, the first... Uh, when we met Lee, we had a couple gigs for uh, benefits at alternative spaces. Like, there were lots of benefits. Yeah, I bet. And uh, so it was, it was just basically an opportunity to play. But we had nowhere to rehearse, and we sat around in the, what was white columns then, and we couldn't make a lot of noise. And in fact, we didn't have any amps, so we were, <laughs> we were just kind of um, plotting out, mapping out what this song would be. Like, you know, okay, let's do this for this amount of time, like double strumming, or you know, it was kind of a, just like a map of sound without the sound. And then, so when we, we plugged in and played, it was like, it was kind of uh, great. <laughs> it was like, it was like uh, discovering a new land or something. And, um, and then we eventually, we didn't have a drummer at first. So, you know, I remember one time we were practicing and Thurston took a drumstick and he put it in his guitar and he started hitting it in this percussive way. Yep. And we had really shitty guitars, so... Um, we tuned them in ways like Glenn Branca, you know, like it sounded better, didn't sound good playing power chords. Um, it sounded better detuned or some other weird tuning. Yep. And um, it was like being blind and kind of feeling your way, you know, through yep. some, like passage or something. And... Um, you know, and then we had uh, different drummers for the first bits. We, Richard Edson, this guy who went on to be an actor, and he he played with us off and on, and um, and then Bob Burt, and then Steve eventually. Yeah, I think it's really kind of, um, you know, it's easy to say, oh, it's cool that you didn't learn to play, but I do think that the actual the idea and and not just in a musical sense. So many people are so scared to do stuff. I'd be one of them. So, like, I've always wanted to be a drummer. Um, to actually just go, pick something up, and just do it is... Yeah. Well, it was kind of all in the spirit of sort of post-punk, you know, like, I think punk rock 
brought a lot of people into music who had no plans to be in music. Yeah, you know, it's just the spirit of the time. And, um, and for me, it was also, I think, a little bit of um, the residue of being influenced by the Velvet Underground and the Factory and Andy Warhol. And it was kind of, New York just had that sort of mystique about it that um, no other, you know, I didn't know of any other place that had that. I know that one time, I, I laughed quite hard for a bit, um, when you actually said that um, Sid Vicious was a, was a really good... <laughs> favourite bass player. Yeah. Your favourite bass player? Yeah. And I was like, when in the history of ever have those words ever been uttered? Like, as much as we might have loved and romanticised about Sid Vicious, but I kind of got it. I was like, it, it wasn't about this, you know, natural right. ability or right, anything. Right, exactly. It wasn't about that. It was you know, the, the chemistry of Sid or, you know, what he brought to the band. And bands are special be, and um, especially the way we made music, it was really based on our different personalities and what we brought to it um, because we would sit around endlessly <laughs> kind of jamming and working on shaping a piece of sound or something. And I felt like what I brought was minimalism and space. <laughs> yeah, I was certain, like, I'm not going to really learn. Like, that's my job not to really, you know. I know what the strings are. So. Yeah. I got this. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so live music, like, in, in, in one sense, like, you're still going and seeing live music, no doubt. Mm -hmm. Um, then you listen to something that's recorded and put out, you know, vinyl, CD, whatever, digitally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if there's an overproduction of things, it can kind of spoil things as well. So playing live is still... Mm -hmm. When you hear somebody, you know, as, as you get older, yeah. um, I, you know, for me, when people... Like, my best friend is like, that can't be fucked, I'm going to bed. Yeah. Like, I'll, I'll chuck a Spotify playlist on. Yeah. I'm like, dude, when did you become that guy? So uh, while I, I, I get it, I find it incredibly sad at the same time because, you know, that performance. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to really tell about a band sometimes who you see them live because yeah. production can make them seem like some other band or, you know, really smooth or... By the same token, sometimes watching a live band can be amazing, and then you hear what they record, oh, yeah. and you're like, Yoke. "Oh yeah, yeah." I mean, in the beginning, people would always say, "Oh, your records don't do justice, you know, to your sound live, or it doesn't sound that way." And you're thinking, "Well, when you're at a gig, you're listening to like huge speakers, and you know, <laughs> the sounds is like, yeah, of course it's not the same, but." I, I think after a while we we became better at recording in a more naturalistic way, but I also think we just kind of gave in to, well, this is kind of a document of the songs in a different way or at a different time. Certainly the, the first record was like that. Um, and, um, you know, we didn't really, yeah, we didn't know what we were doing. There, there's a beauty in like people's first records when they don't know what they're doing too because it can just be this spasmodic thing that um, and then you spend you know the rest of your everything gets more refined after that so confusion is sex first album that's well there was an EP Officially. before that but right. I guess that was the first album yeah yeah and that was such a mess <laughs> a hot mess we did a lot of a lot of wrong things. <laughs> yeah, right. And you, um, uh, you did the artwork for that one. I'm interested in the, the artwork for your albums as well, being a visual artist. Um, did you kind of, was that your domain to look after the cover art and things? The Not sleep at all. Work? I mean, we were super democratic and... Um, you know, it, I think we got into using our artists 
work for our covers. And I think part of that was so none of us felt bad about not using our own art. Right. <laughs> oh, this is awkward. <laughs> uh, but, um, no, I think, um, you know, Thurston Wood, he was a Leo, and, you know, he's a Leo. <laughs> he's still alive. <laughs> but he would, you know, he would, it was almost like he could intuit. Like, he would always, you know, he would often suggest people who are friends of mine, who, you know, his work he, he got into, but it was like, I would be mortified to ask them. Like, I would feel that's so audacious to ask right. them. But he would bring it up, and then I'd be, well, yeah, that's, that's a great, you know, great idea. So I actually have to credit him with instigating a lot, of, a lot of that. And that was a lot of his role in the band, who was kind of an instigator. Yeah. Because Goo, I, don't, I think it was Goo, um, whether Raymond. Ex, they didn't really like it. The, uh, the cover. Oh, the record up. cover, yeah. yeah. They were disappointed that it was in black and white. <laughs> wow. And, um, but I was like, oh, no, but look, at the inside, it's all these goofy color photos of, you know, us, you know, so it's a surprise. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like it's become an iconic color. And, uh, but that was, uh, that was also the beginning of um, the PMRC, where they were, like, labeling music that wasn't, was unfit for... Oh, okay, uh, with the explicit language. Yeah. Um, and uh, so there was a little controversy about Raymond's slogan, too. Yep. His caption on it, rather. Uh, I just uh, wanted to bring up a little guy called LL Cool J. Mm -hmm. You were a bit of a fan of his going back to Cali. I've got that on beautiful 12-inch vinyl, lovely. Um, as a result, uh, you know, on the album we've just talked about, Goo, Cool Thing popped up. Um, I guess, how do you reckon hip-hop's going, liberating us girls from white <laughs> corporate <laughs> yeah. oppression? Yeah, well, it was, um, yeah, that was kind of about um, expectations about people you admire and projecting stuff on them. And I, his first record, I was a huge fan of, and Rick Rubin produced it, and I was curious how much input LL L Cool J had on the kind of rock samples and or what he was, you know, what kind of rock do you like? And I had the opportunity to interview him because Spin Magazine asked yep. me to do something. Um, and he was... Really, it disappointed me. <laughs> he, you know, he said uh, Bon Jovi was his favorite <laughs> rock band. <laughs> <laughs> I said but, good day, sir. <laughs> yeah. That's what I would say. But um, anyway, it was, um, yeah, it was... Disappointing. Disappointing. How do you think Chuck D feels about it? Because it was quite funny, I hear, that... Because um, you didn't actually do a duet. You did it. Well, yeah, I mean, we were working at Green Street Studio and they were doing their record in the other room. And, you know, we were, I think we'd actually maybe met them when we were doing Daydream Nation at that studio. Um, so, yeah, we asked Chuck, if, he was always waiting for Flavor Flav to show up. For like, <laughs> the like, dude's got a clock around his neck. Can't he be on time? Like, yeah, like no, for like a day and a half or two days or something. He's, and then eventually you'd hear these big feet. He was a problem with looking at his clock like, that it was upside down. Flopping down the stairs. Jeez. Um, <laughs> we were like, Chuck, do you want to do a little cameo on this song? And, uh, and then finally, like, of course he just. Did these I love of this. cliches like word up, <laughs> like it is, yeah, you know, which you know we deserved, but it works, you know. <laughs> oh, it totally worked, but yeah. just the fact that he was just like, bleh, bleh. yeah, yeah. Thanks, Chuck. Yeah, off you, you know. Yeah. Chicone Youth. Also, one of my favourite um, stories is I think. <laughs> On the same label, there was a uh, kind of hair metal band called Spread Eagle at the time. Spread Eagle. Maybe Spread Eagle. Oh, and they were doing, um, they were like 
you know, the label had thrown all this money at them to do a clip, you know, helicopters, the whole thing. You just... Uh, was that Gun Guns N' Roses? Or, <laughs> I hope it was. Guns N' Roses. No, no, no. But you just kind of rocked in with your $20 Addicted to Love recorded down at Macy's. Yeah. Yeah, I recorded this. It was a... Chacona Youth was a uh, record that we decided we were going to just go into a studio and make up stuff. Like, a, like... I guess the way we thought rap records were. But we didn't want to make a hip-hop record. It, so it was more like a German prog rock. <laughs> what it was. Yeah. And I, at some point, just got kind of bored. So I didn't go to the studio. And I thought, I'm going to do stuff outside the studio. And I did a couple things. And one was going to um, one of those places on St. Mark's. We could go in and record yep. kind of karaoke. And then I took it to the studio and we sped it up and made my voice sound more like a pop singer, like just turned it up and <laughs> speed it up. It sounds higher and stuff. And, um, and then I went to Macy's because they had, you, know, you could go in for $19.99 to a video booth and make a video, choose your background. And they had two different cameras. Yep. So I chose a, gun, a jungle fighting a bit backdrop, and I was just, it was so satisfying to walk out, <laughs> just give my credit card, 1999, and have a, like, a video. It was, it was, like, empowering. I just can't imagine the record uh, company exec sitting there just kind of going, what just happened? Like, 20 bucks? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't even know if they saw it, but we did, um... <laughs> Uh, you know, it did end up on a compilation of ours. Yeah. Uh, did it kind of give you a taste for video producing, seeing as you, um, you directed one of my favourite, uh, my other Kims, Kim Deal's Cannonball with Spike Jones, that yeah. guy? Um, how was that? As a pro had, is that the first time that you'd actually, I mean, besides Addicted to Love and your 20 buck video, is that the first time you'd really directed? Uh, yeah, I mean, I did a, a film in art school, but it was like a film about Patty Hearst. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, that was the first time I was involved in doing a video. And um, Yeah, I asked Spike because I knew he had a production company, and, you know, Kim was distrustful of most everyone. So, and she saw that we'd made videos, and I survived. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so we did this video, and I actually kind of used a, this idea of dance, of the mirror. So we had yeah, this mirror with the, for the band's performance, and it was great because it deconstructed the whole thing. You could see the camera. And, then, and Spike's idea was the cannonball, which is like such a, you know, just Ridiculous. video yeah. director thing to do. You know, like it's, of course, you have a cannonball that you... But it was also very spiked because it was like rolling it down streets and <laughs> it was very skateboarderish, yeah. you know. And, um, so it really worked out well. It was just kind of. You've collaborated with Kim since then, Little Trouble Girl. Um, What's that? Little Trouble Girl. Oh, yeah. Wow, that moment in time. I think I'm still getting over it. Kim Gordon and Kim Deal in the same film clip at the same time. <laughs> Are you with me? Yeah. yeah. That was, um, that was uh, a weird experience because, well, it was our most expensive video. Oh, really? And this director, Mark Romanek, it was the first time he and, um, he worked with this fantastic DP, Harris Savitas, who also did film, who's since passed away, but he, it was the first time they were shooting in video. So it took longer also right. than... I mean, he was used to doing two-day shoots anyway because he always did huge budgets. Yeah. Um, but it was the first time I'd been away from my daughter. She was pretty young. and So I really thought I was going to get this midnight flight red-eye back to New York. And, and it was just me and Kim, and she was um, being Kim. <laughs> 
Um, you know, we had our both had our own kind of neurotic things, and um, but I remember <laughs> Mark getting mad at me because I wasn't lip syncing very well. <laughs> I said, come on, didn't you bother to, like, memorize the lyrics? <laughs> um, but it was, it was really, actually, it turned out pretty, pretty cool. It was the first time we actually just didn't use one of our ideas and just, like, opened it up who, to different directors and asked them for their ideas and right. picked his because it was just seemed kind of funny. Yeah. All right, so... Um, you, you've kind of said that you weren't really, um, you, you know, you didn't necessarily grow up politically active. You kind of just sort of, it kind of just happened the whole, I mean, because people would call you a feminist, mm -hmm. but you didn't really see yourself necessarily as a feminist. It was something you kind of grew into. Um, well, I guess I, I felt sort of, um, I don't know, I felt like political political groups could be really dogmatic in a way or um, not see the whole picture in a certain way. But I certainly saw myself as a feminist. I mean, I inside was like, I'm a feminist, but I, I felt like I don't have the right, to, like I'm not out there like being politically active. So um, I, you know, you can either be an artist or you can be Political. It's very hard to right. But you know, I, I wrote lyrics about things. I felt like oh, there's a lot of as a woman. Or there's like a lot of subject matter that hasn't been written about. So um, when we signed to a major label, I felt like this is a really good kind of platform to write about like um, sexual harassment in the workplace or something and swimsuit issue. Swimsuit issue. Yep. Um, but, it, you know, it wasn't so premeditated. It was kind of, I just, it was just, however I could say, kind of, fuck you to the record label. You know, I'm like a corporate sort of situation that we were, of course, at the same time, you know, like getting, you know, we did sign to a major label. Um, but it didn't mean that we had to, um, you know, sort of toe the party line or whatever. But, um, you know, there are people like, yeah, Kathleen Hannon, the, the right girl. You know, we were both, first we were, became aware of their fanzines and, you know, it was really interesting and as kind of... Second girl gems? That was second a... Second generation feminist. Feminist. Or, or yep. third or fourth. Yeah. Um, and, I don't know, it just seemed, it was so great, you know, so exciting to see what they were doing. Yeah, she certainly um, uh, name-checked you a yeah. number of times as being an influence of hers as well. Um, I also wanted to talk to you about... Um, this is just a kind of cute story. How, how fun was it to, um, to do The Simpsons <laughs> and especially Homer Palooza? What an episode. Yeah. Uh, especially singing uh, a composition by somebody you formerly dated, Danny Elfman. Right, that's right. That I was, was listening fun. to Oingo Boingo today, which was a treat. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah, Danny and I went out in high school and then a little bit after that. Um, and at that time, he was... The, it, Oingo Boingo were more of like a... Um, kind of a burlesque, surrealist marching band or yep. something. <laughs> And I went to New York and later, you know, they became like a new wave band or something. And, um, uh, and I would come home and I would see, you know, like we'd have friends in common still and he'd ask about my band and stuff, you know, which was not famous at all. So anyway, it was great to um, be able to redo his theme song. Yep. And it was funny because then... Years later, after that, running into him somewhere, and uh, he was basically hanging out with my daughter, and she was a big Simpsons fan, and uh, he was saying how that's still what he's known for more than anything, is that theme song. Yep. And I think that's probably the thing that 
Sonic Youth is known for it the most. That and um, Guitar Hero. You know, that yeah, game. right. <laughs> Amazing. That game, yeah. That's a whole era of people. Yeah. Like, yeah. My, my youngest daughter wouldn't have known Primus, John the Fisherman, if it weren't for... Boy, I played that song a lot of times. <laughs> it's like it's three o'clock in the morning, go to bed. <laughs> yeah. um, also, uh, Body Head with Bill Nace. How do you see the, the difference between Sonic Youth and Body Head? Um, well, it's really freeing, actually, not to have a drummer, in a way. Uh, you know, those drum sound checks. No, no more drums. Boring. Yeah. I went out with a drummer. <laughs> Boring. No. Can we, can we change the music not to have a drummer and be making your own rhythms, even if they're just in your head? Yeah. No one else can hear them. Uh, but no, I, I see it as it as like, well, finally, I'm just going to play music again that I don't have to promote, no one's going to care about. Uh, but it was incredibly fun. And, um, you know, and then it was weird because we put the record out and there was like a full page review in the New York Times, which is like weird. Not expected. Yeah. Um, but no, I just, it's just, um, you know, I just really like playing with Bill. It's just kind of. Well, as if you haven't got enough happening, you're also yeah. um, glitter bust. Yeah, that's more of a side project. Um, Experiment like I'm an experiment musician, so I should be able to play with anybody. Yep. So you play with a surfer. A surfer. <laughs> no, he's sweet, and um, you know, but I I don't really have time. Like I'm really focusing more on visual art stuff, and um, you know, I just don't really have time to be in more than one yeah. kind of band. Although I have this solo single coming out Monday. <laughs> Um, See what I said? Uh, that's, I did with this producer I met accidentally. <laughs> What's it? Murdered Out? Mur it's called Murdered Out, yeah. It's sort of the lyrics are kind of based on um, where I was kind of interested in when I moved back to LA and this idea of people blacking out their cars with black matte spray paint and the wheels and tinting the windows black. So it's almost like... Nothing's reflected. It's like, a, a, yeah, and it's like reclaiming an object and not being part of a corporate kind of, you know, fetish sort of world. It's almost like saying, yeah, the culture doesn't offer us anything, so, you know, we're not here. Yeah. And, and, but I've started seeing that aesthetic in mainstream design, which is, I looked, I Googled it, and there are, there's a clothes company, it's called Murdered Out, and yeah, it's already, Wow. And we haven't even touched on your fashion, your fashion lines. We haven't talked about your book, Girl in a Band. I do want to ask you, though, I know that it's probably obvious that Girl in a Band... I mean, you, you explained before that you sort of felt like a bit of a secret girl. You were like, oh, I, I'm, I'm the girl in the band. That kind of bit of a tomboy growing up, hanging out with a guy, just not something that needed to be pointed out, and then it was. Mm -hmm. But isn't it frustrating that it still happens? Whereas, you know, for instance, nobody says to Jay Mascus, right. so what's it like playing in an all-boy band? Right. <laughs> like, it doesn't happen. Right. So it still happens now. Yeah. Um, it does, but, um, you know, there, there are, I guess, a advantages to being the girl in the band. Um, I don't know, it, it's just weird, you know, you kind of think of yourself as a person and then um, when we started going to England and doing interviews, um, which never happened in New York actually, because people kind of ignored us. <laughs> uh, but, you know, so even if they were mean, um, it was, you know, some attention and they were the first one to say, yeah, well, what's it like being a girl in a band? And um, I didn't really thought of it, and it just really made me self-conscious as hell. Yeah, right. Um, and then I think they were also like, it was weird that I just kind of dressed more ordinary, and I didn't have a persona like Susie Sue or Lydia Lunch. Or, you know, I wasn't glamorous in that way. And um, um, 
So that was also like, well, being a tomboy was not good enough in a certain way. Yeah, right. Either. <laughs> I don't know. Can't win. Yeah. I was just wondering which artists are making artists art now um, that you follow or enjoy. Which artists? Yeah. You mean like visual artists or? Music or visual, both. Or musicians? Uh, either. Um, I don't know. I listen to like um, a lot of old music. Also like um, I just discovered this band Fleetwood Mac a few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> that record Tusk that everyone hated so much. Like Bill and I are obsessed with it. <laughs> Um, no, I, you know, I like Steve Gunn, I like Angel Olsen, um, Kurt Vile. I mean, I like that sort of indie rock stuff. Um, and then, um, I don't know, you know, like, um, I like um, Catherine Ribeiro, this French, um, she's actually a Portuguese singer. She's great. She, um, she had this band called The Alps that were sort of prog, a little bit proggy. Do you know how to rest? I don't mean like, do you ever take a break, but do you have a state of calm ever, or do you just ever feel comfortable feet, like not making things, or is it a consistent part of your brain that's just always going? Um, I really, tried in the last year not to do very much. Like, um, you know, gain a s sense of self-worth from doing nothing. <laughs> I don't know, just, it isn't, I mean, I have, I've actually, just, I go home on vacations for now and stuff, but um, yeah, I'm learning how to surf. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I like, um, you know, engaging in ideas and, just making stuff, I don't know, it just makes me feel good. I, you know, I'm happiest when I'm just, you know, just yeah, lost in doing something and um, I don't know. What advice, Kim, are you giving to your daughter about men? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know, she's... Uh, She's done pretty well. Um, she did say that the, um, I don't know if this relates to men, but she said the best thing she ever learned from me was how to say no. But um, I think that has to do with opportunities more than, more than men. Hi, Kim. Thanks for coming and having this conversation. It's kind of like three questions at once. But just wondering if you'll be playing here soon or showing your art or collaborating? Um, I don't know, I hope to. I, I just only did a solo show in Brisbane, and, which is something that I don't usually do. But um, no, I look forward to, um, everyone tells me I should do something at the Mono Festival in Tasmania, which is, and especially the winter one. So, I don't know. Maybe you could all write a letter. Or something. Yeah. Done. OK, thanks for coming and um, sharing this with us. I was just wondering, when you were talking about some of the projects that you were involved in and the DIY aesthetic, that's a really kind of prescient uh, prediction for what would happen in mainstream culture today. And that was happening in the 80s and 90s for you. So I guess what I'm wondering is, if you look into your crystal ball and uh, have a peek as to what's going to happen the next 20 to 30 years, what do you see? You don't want to know. It's <laughs> 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 so, so pretty. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't... I, I'm always curious to see, you know, what the kids are up to, but... I don't know, you know, like it's, um, I, I really don't, I have no idea, it, but I, you know, I'm curious, definitely, and, um, uh, you know, I don't know any, I don't know any more than you do. 
<laughs> but do you have a favourite Sonic Youth song and what's your favourite gig you've ever played? Wow. That's a toughie. That's tough. Um, favourite Sonic Youth song. And what's your favourite Sonic Youth song? Schizophrenia. Wow. I don't know, I'm slightly deaf, so. <laughs> no, I don't know, I, um, you know, it's hard to pick one song. I um, actually like that song, Massage the History, that I sang um, a lot. I like the sprawl, I, I like that. Um, I'm trying to think of songs that are, also were fun to play live. And um, when we actually finally relearned how to play Daydream Nation, it became actually fun to, <laughs> to play. Yeah, right. But it was at first, um, you know, it was, it was kind of, um, you can't really hear the bass on the record, so it was really hard to figure out what I was playing. And yeah. only Mark Eibold could figure it out, most of it. Um, and then he would teach it to me. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, but when we played that record live, it had, after not playing it for so long, it had this energy that was way different than everything else we'd been doing later. Yeah. Favorite gig? Do you what? have one? Oh, favorite gig. Um, Obviously, one in Australia. Obviously. I'm just not sure <laughs> which one. Very good. <laughs> no. The best one's the next one in Australia. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? I think you're bloody rad. Um, I've got really strong memories of being in, like, smoky lounge rooms, in my knickers in a singlet, playing air bass to um, dirty boots. And just feeling that energy and just going, my God, this chick is just amazing. And still, my girlfriends and I talk about having a band. I've got a bass guitar in my boot, which I've touched once or twice. Um, I'm just wondering, do you have um, any memories of being young and feeling that you know, amazing energy and that inspiration from other artists? And could you share that with us? Um, oh, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I had this uh, friend who was from elementary school, but then we kind of, was, we went to different schools when we were 13 and 14, and when we were younger, we would pretend, you know, we were, uh, different Beatles were our boyfriends, you know, <laughs> <laughs> as we listened to their music. And then when we were maybe 14 or 15, I remember going over to her house and, Playing, she was playing uh, the Velvet Underground, and we were playing her We were playing the song "Heroin" and enacting it, but we didn't really know what it was. It was just like, oh, we were just like a kind of like <laughs> got really like slow and pretended we were stoned and, and falling on the floor. Uh, but um, no, I remember like just you know being really into. Um, the music. That, my friends, is all we have time for. We've definitely gone over. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for coming. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.